So we're back in Mark 10. Why are we back in Mark 10? Because we've done, uh, because we are starting another mini series on Mark, having worked our way through to chapter 10, verse 12. So this is the next bit, or pericope, as the scholars call it. Did you know that? I've, I've taught you something that's utterly useless, but if you ever get onto U <laughs> University Challenge or a game show on the telly to win a million pounds, there we are. Uh, a chunk of text in one of the four Gospels is called a pericope. I, I will try not to give you any more utterly useless information. Uh, well, here's a story. <laughs> but it will lead into... When I was a very small child, <clears throat> I was studying the phone book, as one might do, flipping up in the phone book. I don't think we... Well, they send us phone books now. They're completely irrelevant, aren't they? And in the phone book, there was an advert for a lorry company, a haulish firm. And the particular lorry had the front of the lorry, and then it had a long back on the trailer. And on it, there was a tarpaulin with ropes over the tarpaulin. And then there was something under the tarpaulin. But you couldn't see what was under the tarpaulin. So what did I say to my mother, do you think? Anybody guess? What's under the tarpaulin, mother, I said. Or words that effect. Thank you, Brian. Not Brian. And do you know what mother said? She didn't say pericope. She said, this is what she said, folks, and this does lead into the sermon, honest. She said, she didn't say, I don't know. She said, nobody knows. <laughs> In other words, I don't know, and I don't know anybody else who knows. But what she said was, nobody knows. And I was about four or five at this point, and you know what? Guess what? Until I was, I'm ashamed of this, but, you know, confession is good for the soul, and I don't mind telling you for the sake of my talk. I think till I was 13, 14, or 15. Do you know what I thought? Yeah, that any lorry that had a tarpaulin on it, there was something secret under there, and only the driver of the lorry and the secret service knew what was that. Nobody knows. I used to look at these lorries. Ooh, that's one of those lorries. <laughs> I honestly, I thought that for 10 years or more. Isn't that bizarre? That's not bizarre. Why is that the case? Why? Yeah, maybe. But, you know, it did used to go through my mind. My mother had told me I was a little child. And a kind adult whom I knew had told me. And I believed them for years and years. I was surprised. When I changed my mind, when I came to realize, hang on, that's not true. I was just ashamed of how many years I believed this stuff. You know? But yes, maybe, okay, Gregor, but you've got the point. Little children have an, in, an, uh, uh, an uh, sort of an intuitive and implicit, that's the word. Little children trust kind, known adults implicitly, don't they? If you've got a, you know, a month other illustrations come. If you've got a primary school teacher who's a really good primary school teacher and also really kind with the little children, the class will adore her or him. And if that teacher says, yes, pigs can fly through the sky or, you know, yes, there is a man in the moon who eats cheese or something, most of them will believe her. That's what little children are like. And if that teacher brings to school a load of sweets and smarties or something and starts handing them out, the little children will just take them and say, thank you very much, and expect to get some tomorrow as well. They won't try paying for them or say, can I give you a bunch of flowers or can, can I bring you a bottle of wine for all the smarties you're giving us? Little kids aren't like that. When little kids have Christmas Day, in a, at least in a fairly happy home, they just look forward to it and they open the presents and, and they don't feel deeply obligated and they're not worrying about are they giving enough to their parents. They're just looking forward to the next birthday or the next Christmas, aren't they? That's what little kids are like. And we need to remember that. Us old greybeards here, or we're not all old greybeards, but we need, to, we need to remember that to understand what Jesus is talking about, don't we? See? Because what does he say? People are bringing... Let, let's, let's look at it now. On page 1014. Um, what is he saying in this little passage? 
people were bringing little children. They wanted Jesus to bless them. They wanted Jesus to put his hands on them. There may have been some superstition in that, but still, you know, Jesus is a special person. He's healed lots of people. They think some kind of blessing will come on my child if Jesus lays his hand on them. And there was some logic in that, even if there was a bit of superstition mixed in as well. But the disciples, no, shoo them away. In the ancient world, children weren't important. They really weren't. Even in Israel, they weren't particularly important. And in the pagan world, they were just regarded as a nuisance until they were adults. Or they were just, you know, they could be useful, especially boys, but basically children. There was a very, generally a very low view of children. It was, as far as I know, l perfectly legal to do child exposure in the Roman Empire and in Greek society as well. The Spartans did it, are famous for doing it in a particularly terrible way, that I think all children were exposed in Sparta. Uh, it was just the, the normal thing, certainly all boys, and only the ones who survived were uh, that, were survived. At least that is what is said about Sparta. But child exposure generally was quite common and it was accepted. And, and there was not, the idea of really caring for little children and meeting their needs and making a fuss of them or anything like that, it was hardly there in the ancient world. I mean, when you've had a baby, you just put it outside your door or take it to a place and you leave it there to see whether someone finds it or whether it just dies or is mauled by, you know, killed by a wild animal. It's a, that, that was very common in the ancient world and, and well known. And it happened, and I believe it was, it was actually legal. It was not illegal to do that. It was a truly terrible thing. The, the, the attitude of most of modern... I know some terrible things still happen to children, but the general attitude of modern society is very, very different. And as far as I can tell, the main factor in changing the culture and most of the world's, a lot of the world's attitude to children. you know what it is, the main factor? Christianity. And at the heart of Christianity, the attitude of Jesus to children. And passages like this, this kind of passage in the Gospels is a major factor in the respect and value and care that is given generally in modern society to babies and to little children actually. Uh, and so the disciples, no, children aren't important, shoot them away. Verse 13. But Jesus says, well, Jesus is, is angry. Right? It's not wrong to be angry. Sometimes it's wrong not to be angry. Esther was confessing she was starting to get angry in a bad way. And I sometimes get angry in a bad way. But I know for myself, I sometimes don't get angry enough about things I ought to get angry about. Jesus was angry here. He was indignant. He, 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 he was outraged by their attitude to these little children and the parents who were bringing them. And he says, let them come to me. Don't hinder them. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He says there in verse... Uh, 14. <clears throat> now, he's not just saying, well, all children are automatically in the kingdom. I don't think he's saying that. But he is saying, amongst other things, children are perfectly capable of being members of my kingdom. Even if they're far too young to understand the gospel or, you know, make a, give a testimony or get baptized or anything like that. These, apparently, by the way, when you look across Matthew and Luke, when you look in, look in Luke 18, you see these were, these were little children. Paideia is the Greek word. Well, Paideia just covers a variety of sorts of little children. Luke 18 calls them, and it's pretty clearly the same incident, brefe, and brefe means babies or toddlers. So these were one- and two-year-olds, maybe some babes in arms. They were very small children. They were tiny ones they were bringing, apparently. And Jesus says, these tiny ones can easily be members of my kingdom. But then he goes on in the next verse, verse 15, to say what seems to be pretty clearly the main thrust of this, because he says at the start of verse 15, see there, truly I tell you, that's like underline, okay, that's, 
He's now using capitals. It's in bold, you know, larger text, whatever. That's what truly I tell you means. Here's the big one. Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Goodness gracious me, what is that saying? And then he takes them in his arms and he puts his hands on them and he blesses them. Amazing, isn't it? And what he's saying is, these tiny little children, oh yes, they are important. I do value them. You must value them. You must look after them. And you must realize that they can be my children easily. They can easily be members of my kingdom. In many ways, they can be more easily than adults be members of my kingdom. They can be blessed, truly blessed. And in fact, guys, no matter whether you are a child, a teenager, a young adult, a middle-of-the-road middle adult, an old adult, really old, whatever you are, and however wise you are, however, however, you are, however good you are at tying your own shoelaces and sorting your own program out and, you know, tidying up your own bedroom <laughs> and stuff, however mature you are. See, it's good to be mature. Parenthesis in the last sentence. We'll come to the rest of that sentence in a moment. But is Jesus saying here we all just need to be like children? You know, clueless, can't do things myself, just depend, be humble and just depend on everybody else to cook my meals, pay my bills, and sort my life out. No, he isn't saying that. See? Surely, he's not saying that. He is surely in agreement with most sensible people in most societies, that by the time you're 12 or 14 or 16, it's good if you can sort your own bodily hygiene out. It's, so, it's good if you can sort lots of things out. It's good if you can, in measure, more and more, in, a, in the right sense, be self-reliant in many, many ways. We, that, that's good. That's part of growing up. And that is good that we can gradually sort out quite a lot. But, you know, even in this world, even with regard to shoelaces and working the computer and paying our bills, and none of us are completely self-reliant. Think of Bear Grylls. Bear Grylls? Have you seen Bear Grylls? Well, I bet, I mean, look, I don't know, I haven't read a biography of Belgrus, but I, I bet that sometimes, after his expeditions where he nearly dies and blah, blah, all this stuff, I bet sometimes he goes to his mother or his girlfriend or his partner or a counsellor or somebody and just cries his heart out. Or at least, you know, he needs sometimes to go down the pub and unload to his mates. Even a man like that is not absolutely independent of other human beings even for this world things, but he is a tough guy, and it's good to grow up and be adult. When I was 18, and I'm not saying this is particularly admirable, but I suppose this is me becoming an adult. When I was 18, and I was going to, thinking of going to university, I was living in Newcastle on time, that's where my parents were. Well, okay, <coughs> there was two universities that were definitely not going on my list of possible universities, and one was Newcastle and the other was Durham. <laughs> I wanted to live, I wanted to see if I could survive in this big, wide, wicked world on my own for eight weeks. <laughs> and that, there's something good. I'm not saying everybody aged has got to be like that, but there's something good about that. Adulthood. So Jesus isn't talking against adulthood here. But what he is saying, <clears throat> he is saying in verse 15 particularly, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter. He's saying, that however it is a good thing for us to learn how to do more stuff and not just to be a pathetic member of our families or our society or any more pathetic than we need to be. We've all, we all need other people for lots of things. But to be unnecessarily pathetic and reliant on others in just a selfish way is not good. He, God does want us to mature, etc., etc. But deep in our hearts, deep down... Are we meant to live life on our own? The really big questions, who am I? What is life for? What makes life secure? What makes life worthwhile? How long am I going to live? How am I going to face death? 
How am I going to be happy today that I know that in one year or 10 years or 50 or 60 years, I'm going to die? What's going to happen to me when I die? Is the question of, is there a creator? And how is my relationship with my creator going? And is the creator the judge? And if the creator is the judge, then what's going to happen about the bad things I've done, etc., etc.? Those big questions, the biggest questions of all in those things and other things as well. Jesus is saying... Don't be self-reliant. Don't be an adult in those things. In those deepest, biggest questions of all, you really have got to be like a little child. You've got to be like a two-year-old on those biggest things. And if you try handling those biggest things of life, let alone God, let alone your relationship with your Creator, let alone the fact you're going to die and you're going to meet your Maker and your Judge, if you try handling any of those things and go on trying handling those things in a self-reliant or adult way, a way that if it's tying your shoelace would be quite handy, uh, quite healthy, if you go on doing that, you won't get into my kingdom. When you die and on Judgment Day, you'll be sent to hell. You won't get into the kingdom. That's what he's warning about. You've absolutely got to be like a little child. In other words, when it comes to God and to me, Jesus, who is God, and to my Holy Spirit, you have got to have an implicit faith, an implicit <sighs> childlike trust in God. You've got to be like a little child child. That's the main point. Does that make sense? That's what I think that's, that's the main thing Jesus is saying here. Let me put it this way. To come to God successfully, to really know Jesus in a way that means you're in his kingdom forever, to do that, you have to come not as an adult, but as a two-year-old or a four-year-old or a five-year-old relates to a kind person that they know well. You've got to release in that way. That is fairly radical teaching, or very radical. It's very radical that Jesus is honoring children so much, but it's also radical that he's telling people they've got to do that. And I think that there's two, two aspects of that. Let me try and elaborate for a moment or two. Partly it means this. It, two things. It means trusting what God says. It means trusting God for grace. Trusting what he says. It means, amongst other things, our attitude to the word of God. How do we know who God is? How do we know what God says? How do we know about these things? And there are all kinds of theories, I know. But the Christian answer is, and Jesus taught this, Jesus taught that the book that what was called even in Jesus' day, the scriptures, the, 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 the Old Testament scriptures that they had then, were, were actually, they were what God says. John 10, 34, Jesus says, the scripture cannot be set aside. John 10, verse 35, the scripture cannot be set aside. And Peter in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 16, and Paul in his first letter to Timothy, chapter 5, and verse... Um, 18, they both talk about at least parts of what we now call the New Testament as though they are scripture. Peter refers to Paul's letters as part of the scripture in 2 Peter 3, 16, for example. Paul in 1 Timothy 5 refers to part of Luke's gospel. He quotes something from Luke's gospel and refers to it as scripture. So this book, the Bible, it says in Isaiah uh, in Isaiah 66, we read this interesting phrase or this interesting sentence. Isaiah 66, the second half, verse 2. These are the ones, God says through Isaiah the prophet, these are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. In other words, to have a spirit of implicit trust in what God says in the book we call the Bible. Now, the Bible says that God is good and loving, and yet God is in charge, and everything is under God's control. We can't figure that how, out sometimes how that is so. If God is running the world, why is he letting this happen, or this happen, or this happen? How is he in control if he's a loving and good God? 
And the childlike approach is to say, I don't know how they fit together, but I'm not God. And God tells me that this is true, and so I believe it. That's what it means. What about human nature? And, and, and the fallenness of human nature, and so on. The Bible tells us that human nature is fallen, that we are sinners who need saving to use some of the Bible's phraseology. And even this word sin is not really understood much these days. It means, you know, bad stuff in the sight of God that, that creates not, isn't just bad vis-a-vis -vis humans, but is bad before God. The Bible tells us that people are fallen and sinful. And again, that's a, it's a very unpopular notion understandably unpopular. We don't like to think that we, and even children, and even, and even very young children, have, we've got something at the very center of us that's bad. We're basically not clean and white and pure and lovely until the nasty world might corrupt us a bit. We're, we're, the badness comes from the human heart. We're fundamentally rotten at the core. We're all rotten apples. When there's a stink on in some organization, oh, there's a few rotten apples, we're, clear, we're clearing them out. And yeah, okay, sometimes organizations do have just a few people who are really bad in the workplace, and the rest are okay. But you know, before God's sight, we're all rotten apples. And we don't just need a bit of help from Jesus, we need new birth, we need new life, we need a new start, we need to receive the Holy Spirit. No, I don't like that. That doesn't seem to figure. That's not very nice. I don't want to believe that. The childlike attitude is, well, it teaches it very clearly. Jesus teaches it abundantly clearly. Mark 7, for example. Paul teaches it, of course, Ephesians 2. Psalm 51 teaches it. The whole Bible teaches it. So the childlike thing is, I believe it. I believe the doctrine of original sin. I believe it. With childlike, that's the childlike approach. Isn't it? Yeah, and just one, one or two more things briefly on the childlike approach. Why does this make sense? Why does it make sense to be like that with regard to God and His Word and what we call the Bible? How can you be intelligent and sophisticated and, and take such an attitude? Number one, because you recognise that your understanding is limited; that you and I know so little. I mean, just listen to or read scientists who are good scientists who are really doing research, they, time and again, when you listen to them, they just say, well, we've discovered this, and we've discovered this, and we've discovered this, and then we just know that there's a whole sea of things we don't yet know about subatomic particles or about quantum theory or about a host of other things. And now, those things, to some extent, you can do experiments. God has put those things under us in a way for us to look at them and investigate them and experiment. When it comes to God, is there a God? What's God like? We, we're in, we can't do ordinary experiments on that. We are the whole structure of created reality. Is You've got to depend on God to know what God's like and to know what's outside of this cosmos and to know what happens after people die. You can't possibly figure that out. So it makes sense to say, well, we either know nothing or we've got to listen to God if there is a word from God. And also, when it comes to it, we're not only ignorant that way, we're so prejudiced, aren't we? I was just talking to Sean the other day about the fact that, you know, we had this financial crash 2008. Warren Buffett, who sounds like he's quite a, uh, quite a wise fellow, you know, but it was all to do, the 2008 thing had a lot to do with lots of dodgy debts, and people didn't know what was in the debts, and they were developing packages, and people were spending huge amounts of money for financial packages, and they didn't really know what was in the packages, but it seemed to be working, and there were lots of other people doing the same thing, and for the time being, they were making lots of money, and lots of them just went over a cliff edge in 2018. Warren Buffett knew in 2002 this was a bad idea, and he warned about it in 2002, but the but a, a large number of bankers and investors didn't pay any attention. Why didn't they pay any attention? Anybody? Yeah, they were making money. They were making money. It was working. It was a gravy train. It was Monopoly, and lots of people were playing, and they were making money playing Monopoly. 
In other words, but what it shows is, and I'm just having a go at them, it's just a very obvious example, our desires affect our intellects. Mm. And we need to know that. And when it comes to God, our desires affect our intellects. We need to let God tie us back down to his word. <laughs> implicit trust. So that's one side of it. And then the other thing about implicit trust is trusting for grace. Trust God not only for what he says, trust God for grace. As I said, with regard to children, on Christmas Day, children in a fairly happy home, they're not worrying about, you know, what did I buy from mum and dad, or, you know, I better pay somebody for some of this. They're just being happy and looking forward to the next thing. <laughs> they're able to receive. They don't mind in a fairly happy home. They don't mind, to some extent, being under the control of loving, wise parents. They're okay with that, and they're okay just to receive, to live by grace. And that's how God would have us live before him. We find that difficult. As adults, we find that difficult, don't we, between us, you know? When you go to someone's house for a meal, what are we going to take? And I'm not saying that's a wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong to take somebody, but, but you know, the, the feeling that, oh, we couldn't possibly go to someone's house for dinner or supper unless we do something. Oh. I think there is something. I'm not saying the custom is bad, but I think the feeling you couldn't cope without doing that. Hang on, why not? Why can't you just say, thank you very much. I'm skinned, or I didn't have time, or blah, blah, blah. And no embarrassment. Anyway, but that's by the by, that's social convention and stuff. I'm saying, but between us and God, it really is important. It's, Jesus is saying, it's absolutely essential that when you come to Jesus Christ to be forgiven for the 1,000th time and to receive assurance that when you die, you'll go to his kingdom, not to a bad place, or when you come to Jesus Christ for the first time and ask him to forgive you and save you and give you the Holy Spirit and come into your life and change you when you come to him for the first time really, really seriously. Jesus is saying it's vital that you don't think you've got to bring a bottle or a bunch of flowers to God. That's what he's saying. Come naked. Come skint. Come as a beggar. Come as a person who's rotten at heart. Come with no love for God. Come with your selfishness and your pride and, and the fact that you can't cope with life and the fact that some people near and near to you are driving you crazy and you hate them. Come with the bad stuff as you are. And don't try paying God for a, with a single penny. That is really, Jesus is saying, that's crucial. If you try paying if you try paying, I'll sing, I'll sing the next. I'll sing, I'll sing the next song to that tune if you like. No, I'll sing the next part of the sermon. Fine, that's fine. Jesus is saying, "Don't do it." That's what he's saying. Mm. And I think I'll close on this just by repeating. I'll close because my time's gone. I'll close with some of the words of that song we've sung. We sang that song, didn't we? Rock of ages cleft for me. Do you pay? And then we sang it to that, that old tune. I think it's the old American tune. They used to come up in movies 50 years ago a lot. You know, they're in a, they're in a Baptist church somewhere in Arkansas. And they're always singing. They're always singing. Rock of ages. And in a way, do you know, I mean, in a way, it's a lousy tune, that one. No, I shouldn't say that, should I? Because he, he's chased the tune. I'm just so indiscreet, aren't I? Never mind. Oh, you chose the tune, okay. It's, because in a way, it's a sort of casual, we've just, we've just ridden into town on our horse. But listen to the words. I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to read some of the words again. The words. The word, especially verses two and three. Just listen to this. This will be the close. This, this is... This is childlike attitude when it comes to receive grace. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill your law's demands. Could my zeal no respite? No. Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. You must save, and you alone. You come skint.
or you don't really come at all. Jesus says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to your cross I cling. Naked, come to you for dress. Helpless, look to you for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. See, it's saying you're covered in dirt, and Jesus is the shower, and you don't clean yourself up first. You go into the shower covered in dirt. Jesus is the shower. That's what the last two lines mean. Foul I. I'm foul. Covered in muck. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's the attitude, isn't it? Does that make sense? So we all need to be like this. If, you don't re if you've never really known Jesus as your Savior and Lord, this is how to come to him today, like a spiritual beggar. And if you have come before, but now you're doing what Tim said we easily do earlier in the service, didn't you, Tim? We easily think, oh, I've been saved now. And, um, you know, God's made me a little bit good now. So now I've got a bit of, you know, I can have a little bit of spiritual swagger now that God has blessed me so much and I know so much theology and I've been baptized and I've given my testimony at the front of the church. And, hey, I'm really getting somewhere now. That is the way not to make progress in the Christian life. The way to make progress is to come every day to Jesus like a beggar. Oh, but Chris, what about good works? Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance that we should do them. Ephesians 2.10. But notice the context. It's saying all the good works we do, even the best thing that the best Christian ever does. Look at the context in Ephesians 2. It's all 100% the fruit, the product, the effect of God's grace. It's 100, not 99%, it's 100% the fruit of God's grace. That's what Ephesians 2 is about. For 35 years, I didn't understand that verse. Because I'm a Pharisee too. Let's pray.